So on today's episode, I'm really excited to have with me Joel Wolfson. And Joel is a successful fine art photographer who also loves teaching as much as shooting. He's pursued both of these passions since college in the mid 80s and shares his 25 plus years of experience as a working pro with other photographers by way of his workshops, one on one training, webinars, articles, his blog and speaking engagements. Joel's custom training and workshops are available to all levels of photographers and he also works with great affiliates like Topaz Labs and Arizona Highways to create more avenues for working with those wanting to pursue their love of photography. He's been published internationally and his articles have been translated for use in more than 30 countries, yet he is best known for his artistic images of nature's fleeting moments and unexpected views of everyday places around the globe. So hi, Joel. I'm really excited to have you on here with us today, and I'm sure we've got some great treats and ideas to share with folks about your travel photography and your workshops. Hi, Nigel. Thanks. My pleasure, and I'm excited too. There's nothing I love more than talking about this stuff with other photographers. So you've been in the photography business now for a good amount of time. What was that first piece of inspiration that really got you fired up about pursuing photography? That was a long time ago, but I would say initially I did have some trepidation about going into photography as a business. It, it, it's something I lived and breathed and loved before I went into it professionally, and I was afraid that it might not be fun if it became a profession. And then I had a photographer that I admired ask me if I would uh, be able to assist him. And, of course, I jumped on that, and it uh, made me realize that as a freelance assistant, I could learn the business, get paid for it, and work with all different photographers. And that's what I ended up doing. It was a wonderful opportunity. I worked with some of the best shooters in the world, and that was the turning point. That must have been quite an amazing experience to work with so many talented people like that. Uh, it really was. I was I was a little mouse in the corner, and uh, the best part was I got paid to do it, and it was really a great experience. I, I have to admit, I, I enjoyed the assisting as much as, as shooting, just because I was learning. And, and it was also a way to supplement my, my income as a photographer, which when you start out, of course, it's uh, not always a full-time gig. So it was, it was a great way to uh, push myself along the way. Did you make it a full-time operation fairly early on in the business? Uh, you know, I did. Most of my income the first year was probably from freelance assisting. Um, I started out doing magazine work. I, I sort of <clears throat> realized from working with these various mentors that you needed to establish a name for yourself and, and a reputation. So I did that by getting assignments with um, magazines and doing editorial work. And, you know, that gives you some uh, street cred, so to speak. With the travel photography, I mean, was that something that you started out right from the very beginning or was that a genre that you drifted into over time? Let's see, directly making money from travel photography per se like I do now, no, I didn't start out that way. Um, however, travel has been a passion. Uh, I think the second I got out of the house at age 18, I took my first overseas trip and uh, of course I'd traveled domestically prior to that and, and, and I was hooked. But uh, I started out doing the magazine work and then corporate work for ad agencies, corporations, public relations firms, that sort of thing. So more on the commercial end of photography initially. I loved the editorial work. It didn't pay quite as well as the corporate work, but it was a way to establish myself, establish my name, and, and get the good paying jobs. And so it wasn't really until I made a conscious decision to leave Minneapolis, where I was living at the time, where I had a lot of nice Fortune 100 clients. My friends thought I was crazy. And I moved to Arizona to pursue the travel photography, the fine art, you know, landscapes, all, the, all that sort of stuff that I'm better known for now. So was it a bit of a hustle at the beginning, you know, with the travel stuff and getting those kind of gigs that you wanted or, or at least getting your work featured in the places where you wanted it to be seen? Yeah, you know, like anything else, it's a process, and I would have to say I probably I probably took on a lot um, choosing two of the most difficult areas of photography, which was uh, travel photography and then selling it in the fine art market. At the same time, I was lucky that a lot of the stuff I like to shoot, people seem to like to buy. So that was good, but it, but it, really, it really was a lot like starting over. 
you know, like I say, I left my clients behind. I made a conscious decision that I didn't want to do assignment and corporate work anymore, or at least minimize it. And it really was like starting a whole new business. I mean, the the upside was that that I had already had you know, several years experience as a professional photographer and all of that experience culminates, you know, in your head and it helps you get going on the next phase, so to speak, which for me was the fine art and travel photography. Travel photography is our main theme for today, of course. And I know that this is an area that a lot of photographers would just love to get into. I mean, who, who doesn't think that traveling is all glamorous and exciting? <laughs> yes. right? But I'm sure it's not as easy as just packing a bag and jumping on a plane. What, what typically goes into the planning of a trip for you? You know, the overseas stuff takes the most planning. And if I'm going to a new area, I have to work farther in advance um, sometimes I will also piggyback a workshop with a shooting trip, and that basically helps for ROI, return on investment. So if I'm combining a workshop and it's a new area, that's, that really requires the most advanced planning. Just as an example, I'm, I'm doing a shoot and a workshop in South Africa in 2016. I started planning it a few months ago, so more than two years in advance. Uh, I do a lot of research. Um, especially if it's a new area. That could be anything from going to the bookstore and looking at coffee table books uh, with photos of the area I'm going to, connecting with people in that area, other photographers, any kind of resources I can find and, and people, and uh, looking at stuff on the Internet. I, I try to make use of just about you know every avenue I can to kind of thoroughly research the, the areas that I'm going to to make sure that it all kind of goes smoothly when I'm there. There's also the whole logistics end of it too. I'll just mention that I, I have a couple articles on my blog. One, one is about the logistics, like basically just getting your, all your gear over there safely and getting your images back along with your gear and just sort of all those logistical issues, checklists and whatnot. So, the, so there, is a, there is a lot of preparation. Sometimes I don't have the time to do all the scouting uh, while I'm there, so then my wife gets the good job and she gets to go ahead of me, you know, especially if it's for a workshop, she can try out the restaurants, the gelato shops, the espresso bars, <laughs> uh, go, to, go to all the cool towns, so she, she really has the glamour job when, uh, when there's some extra scouting required. Um, and of course, I scout everything again when I go there and, and uh, along with the shoot. You mentioned the idea of ROI, return on investment. So clearly, this is a commercial enterprise. This is not you going on a whole series of different vacations and holidays where you just take a camera and hope for the best. What do you typically look for in terms of you know, the end game? What is it that you want your photographs to do for you when you come back in, as, with regards to getting that good ROI on the trip? You know, I have certain avenues where I sell. I, I sell mainly in the fine art market. So the idea is to shoot for my market. I know what my customers like. Uh, if I've got particular shows coming up in the next year or two, um, I will keep that in mind when I'm shooting. And I would say, you know, that I shoot both for myself and for my market. So you you do want this to be enjoyable. <laughs> and, and that's why I got into it. And I can't ever stop shooting for myself. I, I might shoot photos that I know no one will ever see besides me or possibly my family. But I also just shoot the stuff I want to shoot. And, you know, a lot of times, even though I go there with, with a, an idea in my head of, of shooting, shooting for my market, and this is the ROI part, I may come back with some surprises. You know, you, you don't really know until you get over there. Even if it's an area you know, you're just, you're just going to run into things th that might be really hot sellers. I, I have one image that comes to mind in my head that it was, it was the middle of the day, you know, during, during icky light, so to speak. And it was just something I happen on to. I'm always wandering when I'm traveling. And I was wandering through this little village on the Italian Riviera. And it was a very, a very simple shot. And it's turned out to be one of my best-selling shots. So those are sort of the two aspects, you know, whether you can do a really detailed return on an investment, you know, is another story because sometimes, especially in the fine art market, sometimes it's hard to predict 
what you're going to sell at the end. And then the other thing is that more often now with my overseas trips, I am combining it with a workshop. And that's a little easier to know what your end game is, so to speak, because I, I can start booking that a year in advance. So I may have a pretty good idea just because I've been doing this for years, how much I might come out on the at least the workshop part of it to help cover expenses. And then I can look at the fine art as equal or additional sales. Uh, you know, the percentage varies on the location and what the workshop is and what the, uh, what the assignment is, so to speak. It's, it's, I essentially give myself assignments on what I'm going to shoot when I'm over there. And this, you know, this would, this would hold true, I think, too. Uh, uh, you know, I'm talking a lot about overseas stuff. Uh, that's what I like to do, but I do a lot of domestic stuff, too. So, you know, basically travel photography just means you leave home. So, you know, you might not be going very far and it's still travel photography. You still need to keep all these aspects in mind. So for people who are getting started in travel photography or want to get started with it, what three pieces of advice would you have for them? I think the first one is easy. Just make sure that travel and photography are passions. Uh, this is not an easy business. Otherwise, it's just a job and, and, and why do it? And, and it makes it that much harder. So I've always been an advocate all through my photographic career of just trying to follow your passion. The other aspect is that travel photography really covers a really broad range. So use number one, essentially, and follow your passion. You can give yourself assignments based on that, but try to figure out some kind of focus. What aspect of travel photography are you interested in? Maybe you're into wine and you can cover wineries, uh, grape harvest, do close-ups of wine being poured, people doing a wine tasting, portraits of vintners, you know, there's all kinds of things. You know, maybe your thing is big cities and you want to do photos of teenagers in Rome and what they do. Uh, you might, it might be small towns, big cities, architecture, food, people. And remember that all of this has to be in the context of where you're going. So then the third thing I would say, and these are all interrelated, try to make a business plan. Um, if you're just getting into travel photography and you know you want to do that, you've decided it's a passion and you have some idea the types of things you might want to shoot, that's going to help determine what your market is. Your market might be editorial. You know, let's take the wine example. You might try to sell a story to Wine Spectator. Uh, you might try to be a regular with them. You might hit on numerous magazines and try to hit a food and wine aspect. Or uh, you might be more interested in landscapes and uh, pursue that avenue. But you really need, it's, it's like any other business. You need to put together a business plan. And just going through that exercise will, will actually help you find markets or maybe realize that there isn't a market for the particular thing you want to do. It can work both ways. But I think it's a really important exercise to go through uh, to have an idea for selling the photos or the stories that you're going to put together. And if possible, try to sell stuff in advance. If, if you're just starting out, you're going out on your first venture, try to sell something in advance. Pitch it to your clients. Try to pitch it to a magazine. It's, it's not a bad idea to uh, you know, have something in your pocket before you go, or at least have uh, an idea what's going to go in your pocket when you get back. So what would you say are some of the biggest challenges associated with this business? When people ask me why I went into this business, I... I answer that I was going to be an actor, but I wanted a challenge. I would say, you know, the biggest thing really is, I mean, there's, there's a financial thing, of course, um, and that's just a matter of doing the right things and building up momentum. But I'd say the planning and coordination are, are really some of the biggest challenges. We have to balance all this with our life. Hopefully you have more than just your career. And, you know, I've got a, I've got a daughter and pets and family in town and all those sorts of things I have to consider when I, when I, plan and coordinate all these things. And then just some of the things I mentioned before, just just the long and sort of detailed process of the planning and then trying to coordinate everything. Yeah, I remember probably about 10 or 12 years ago talking to Flip Nicklin. He was uh, he, one of the National Geographic's top uh, whale and dolphin photographers. And of course, he was jetting around all over the world on these assignments to go photograph whales and dolphins in their natural habitats, a lot of which was up in the Arctic. And <laughs> I said, what do you do in between? Oh, he said, all I do is just literally go home, put my suitcase down and pick up another one that's already packed and then get back on a plane. 
Oh yeah, that, that could be tough. It's it's not always as glamorous as you think if you're on the road all the time and away from your family and all that sort of thing. So you, you really do have to think about balance with your life. It isn't just about the business. So as much as you might love photography, you don't you don't want to give up everything else for it. Indeed. And, you know, this travel thing is not quite as glamorous as a lot of people imagine it to be, is it? Uh, no, it isn't. It's enjoyable work for sure, or I wouldn't, or I wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. but it is work and it's hard work. So you, you need to be prepared for that. And you brought up a good point about uh, this photographer where, where Geographic was sending him all over the world. You know, most of the traveling I do, I'm paying for myself, and that's why I, I do think about getting a payback and the return on investment. You know, for those of you that are commercial photographers, if you have clients, you know, that have international business, you know, try to get some of those gigs. You know, I, I did some of that um, as a commercial photographer, and then you can, you know, then you might be able to book some time and at least be covering some of your expenses and book some time on the side to get get some photography done for your own travel purposes, for your own photography purposes. It's not always easy to do, but any little extra hook you can get in there to, to try to help cover expenses, especially if you're doing overseas, that's a very expensive proposition. It's many thousands of dollars every time I do a trip, not to mention all the time. And then you have to consider your opportunity costs. So what are you, if you do take a big trip, whether it's domestic or overseas, what are you giving up during that time? Are you giving up uh, income from your your studio at home or whatever else it is you're doing at the time? So you, you want to consider the opportunity cost in your in your ROI as well, and just in terms of planning. You mentioned expenses quite a few times here, and that just brought to mind another quick question. I'm sure that a lot of the expenses that you incur traveling about and stuff it can be deducted from your taxes and that kind of thing and treated as business expenses. How do you go about accounting for all of these expenses from a business point of view? I can tell you that the IRS is way pickier about foreign travel. So if photography is not your full-time profession, be very, very careful about documenting everything and document it anyway. We do a spreadsheet. My, my wife often helps me on these trips. And if it's not my wife, it's an assistant or, or multiple assistants. And, and uh, we keep a spreadsheet every single expense. Believe it or not, we even have a budget for gelato. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea in any case to me. And it's astounding what you can spend on ice cream. But at any rate, we, we keep track of everything I, I, a lot more carefully for the foreign travel than for the domestic, but, but you want to keep track of everything. Uh, if, you're, if you're tracking expenses in this country, you can do it two ways. You can you can write down the exact expenses, the actual expenses, or you can do per diem. And that's just stuff to ask your accountant. But basically, as long as you're shooting and shooting for your business, you can write off any travel you do. That is one huge advantage of this type of photography, at least for me, is that anytime I travel, I'm bringing my cameras and I'm generally shooting stuff that has a potential to sell. So I will write off virtually any kind of travel that I do as long as I'm doing it at least partially for business. If I have days that are personal days, I keep track of those and I don't write those off. But I, I would say you definitely want to just keep as careful a track as you can and talk to your accountant about you know your best method of doing it. So your typical workflow when editing and processing the images from a trip, what does that tend to look like? My uh, downtime is really download time, so I will try to download and edit on the road as much as I can. I generally will bring my MacBook Air, which is a very lightweight and compact computer, but a very capable one. And I'll even try to do a first round of picks if possible. So anytime I'm not out shooting and doing other things or teaching or whatever it is, as soon as I get back to my hotel, I will try to download stuff. I'll generally only do adjustments for photos that I need right away. For instance, we try to keep a blog of our trips while we're overseas or while we're out and about. People like to kind of follow us during those things. So I'll, I'll work on some of the images for the blog posts and things that I need to upload during the trip. Generally, it's, a, it's just a time permitting thing. So the bare minimum is for me is to try to download the stuff, back it up, back it up again, 
And these days I use SD cards as my third backup. So first I'll back it up to the MacBook Air, then I'll back it up to an external drive, and then I'll make a copy on SD cards and mail those back to myself. I, I realize that sounds a little compulsive, but this is my business. And if, if anything happens, let's suppose you have a case that you keep your computer in and that gets stolen uh, or lost or something happens to it. And if, you're, if your backup drive happens to fail or things didn't get copied right or something like that, you're sunk. So that's the reason I, I do. I used to do DVDs or, and before that CDs and whatnot. But these days you can buy a 32 gigabyte SD card for next to nothing. You can get one or two days shoot on that probably. And then I just mail it back to myself. And, and it's, it's a redundant system. But if you're doing it for your living, it makes sense. If you're just doing it for fun, uh, the minimum you want to do is at least back it up. Get it off your cards and back it up. You can take lots of extra cards and that could be a backup too. So you could load it onto your computer, just keep those cards, don't reformat them and use new cards. But whatever you do, you definitely want to have some backups. What about backup equipment like extra cameras and backup lenses and that kind of thing? Do you take that kind of stuff with you too? I try to take the minimum equipment that I'll need. That said, I think it makes sense to have at least a backup camera body. I think backup lenses is maybe going over the top for me. But that said, it's not unusual for me to bring two systems with me, meaning I have a DSLR system. Uh, currently, that's the Nikon D800 series with some lenses. And then I also have a Micro Four Thirds system, which is like my compact carry it with me system. So I guess in a sense, I do have some redundancy, but for instance, I tend to take more primes, prime lenses with my Micro Four Thirds system because they're so compact and so good in quality, whereas with the Nikon, because it's so big and bulky and heavy, I tend to favor the zooms more. I do have actually a pretty complete checklist of the gear I take on, on my um, traveling for photography article on my blog. I mentioned the computer stuff that's, you know, the images are everything. I, I, my equipment can get stolen and I can replace it. That, you know, that isn't the end of the world, but the images are really, really it. You spend all that time and all that money and put all your heart and soul into it. The images are, are what's important in the end. So that's really, really the area that you want to be most careful about. I mean, you don't want to get your camera stolen either, but that's pretty much it. I, I, ha I have a backup. If I'm just taking one system, I have one backup body and, and the lenses that I need. I, I always take them on the airplane with me and I make sure that I check everything in advance, weight limits and that sort of thing, size limits, and make sure I conform to all that. I do want to say one more thing about the backups. If you're, if you're in the back country, you're in an area maybe where you don't have access to electricity all the time or you're not staying in a hotel or you're in a foreign country where you're in a real, real remote area. There are portable battery-driven backup devices that you can use if a laptop, if it's too impractical to take a small laptop or something. There's a Nexto makes them. There's another brand I can't remember offhand, but they're just very small devices that are essentially card readers with a hard drive. And so you can back up your cards to that, and that way you have a backup with you, even if you're out having to camp and live in a tent or in the bush or something like that. There, there are ways to, to do that, too. In those remote areas, if you're there for an extended period of time, how do you deal with charging batteries up? I have to say I haven't been out long enough that I've had to do that, but colleagues of mine um, have used, th used things like uh, solar power, uh, you know, a, a solar charger or just bring enough batteries with you. You know, at a certain point, if you're bringing enough batteries with you, you, you might also think about just a compact laptop. You know, I think I read somewhere that the latest MacBook Airs have a 12-hour battery life. If all you're using it for is to download photos, you can download a lot of photos with that 12 hours of battery life. So you kind of have to balance it and look at if something like a, a, a card reader backup drive device has enough battery power and you can bring enough batteries that you're not having too much weight and that sort of thing, then you might prefer that over trying to bring your laptop with you. You know, this is something that you could run into doing something like a safari where um, you can only take, you know, a total of 25 pounds and that's everything, cameras, 
computers, clothes, everything if you're going on a bush plane. And it might even be uh, less weight than that. So that's where you really have to start thinking about all those things. But that's that's getting into a fairly, fairly you know, specialized part of backing up and, and keeping things, you know, just exactly what you need with you on, on location when you travel. So obviously the images that you collect and you create while you're on these trips are the single most important thing, as we've mentioned. And when you get back, you need to sell those photographs or, or hopefully enough of them to get a decent ROI on the trip. So what, what channels do you find work the best for you when you're trying to market your photography to potential buyers? My main channel is the fine art market. Now that's, you know, a few different channels within that market, so to speak. And that would be things like art shows, galleries, online. I actually get quite a bit of repeat and referral business. And that's, I think that's really an important thing to build. Yes, you want to get people on your email list. Yes, you want to always try to get new customers, but it's a fruitless battle if you lose if you lose them right away. So you want to do everything you can to keep those customers and keep them coming back and keep them referring you to other people. Those that that's your core business, that's your best business is the repeat and referral. Now you have to build that of course. That's where a lot of what you do comes in handy <laughs> for uh for marketing and and getting leads and uh taking action on those leads and all those sorts of things. I also have, you know, here and there a few non-traditional outlets. Just as an example, there's there's a, a high-end restaurant where I live, and I've done more business with them than I've done with a number of galleries. And I guess they're unique, but they're they're very much into helping me market the art. So, you know, anything you can think of like that, I collaborate with. There's a fantastic painter. A uh, very well-known uh, watercolorist named Steve Stento, and I do collaborations with him. So we do these pieces of artwork that are a mix of photography and painting. And sort of the idea behind them is that when you look at it, you, it's very difficult to tell which is painting and which is photography. And it's really sort of messes with people's minds, and that's uh, sort of part of the attraction of it. So that's another another little uh, avenue for income as well. Uh, I have some friends that are very successful with home shows. It just so happens that my that when I uh, built my house, I built a studio on it, so my studio is connected to my home. So my studio shows are the, would I guess would be the same as a home show, but that's another thing. So it doesn't it doesn't hurt to uh, pursue some of those. But you know, my main ones are are going to be things like art shows, my repeat and referral business, the online business, the galleries, that sort of thing. The online business is one of the biggest things, or one of the first things I think that people trying to sell fine art photography kind of head for. You know, they think, oh, I've got these photographs, I've got this collection of images that I've built up, now I want to sell them, so I'm going to create myself an online portfolio and a, and a, a web store and then just sell them from there. What I've tended to find when I've been talking to photographers who try to do that is that, and quite sadly, the vast majority don't seem to have a lot of success with that approach from the beginning, at least. And they get kind of despondent because they've got the website up, they've got the photographs on there, they're trying to sell them, and things are just not moving. Do you have any thoughts on that element at all? I just have to say that that I agree with you. It's a very difficult way to have be any kind of main revenue source or main avenue for you. I have found that the online persona or the online, my online existence, so to speak, uh, is really kind of backup for a lot of the other things I do and complementary. You know, marketing is all these different avenues of marketing is just kind of like one big conversation with your clients. And it's and the online the website is just part of the conversation. It's it's really you know people uh, buy fine art to hang in their home or their offices, and it's really difficult to get anything across electronically. There's just nothing like seeing it in person. So what I've found is that if somebody sees something at an art show, in this restaurant, for instance, where I sell stuff in galleries, the online part is a supplement in terms of just the galleries online. There's lots of other avenues for online marketing, which of course you're an expert on and um, and you've certainly helped me with that. But the online galleries really are, really are reinforcement. So if somebody sees, for instance, a photo of mine at a show, they're not sure they want to buy it on the spot. I follow up with them. 
I might send them the link on my website to where that image is. They show it to their spouse, and then they buy it. So it, it's good reinforcement. It was a way for them to show it to their spouse. It was a way for me to reinforce that image in their mind. I have an artist friend who does shows and, and says, old is cold. So as soon as somebody shows an interest, you want to follow up right away. And, and that's where your website can really come in handy. I'll even create custom websites for people. So if somebody says, uh, you know, I'm redoing my office, or, or I had a lady that said, I'm redoing my yoga studio, and I want stuff that's sort of zen and that sort of feel to it. So I just put together, I went through my images, I put together all of the images that fit her criteria that I thought would, just to, to find out if we're on the same page. And in Lightroom, you can, you can create a website very quickly. It just takes a few minutes. And I just create a custom website, and they love it because it's you know, got their name on it. It's got all these images, and then I just email them a link. So that's another way you can use your website. But it really is very tough to make it just on that, to expect, like you say, Nigel, that, that you can just set up your website and that you'll sell from that. You really have to have this interplay with other avenues to market your stuff. Some great points. Yeah, and I, I agree with you 100% on that. You know, the website really should be the hub of all of your other activities. And rather than trying to rely on it as the primary sales source and kind of delegating the responsibility of sales to the website, uh, instead of getting out there and you, I mean, you participate in a lot of different things as we've talked about, you do art shows, you collaborate with other artists and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, so you've really got a lot going on. Plus, you, you know, through your educational outreach too, you know, your workshops and your blog and that kind of thing. So another outlet that photographers have available to them for this type of work, and, and of course lots of other genres too, is stock photography. Is that something that you participate in or are the places that you're already selling into better for you? You know, I would say the latter. I used to do a lot more stock. Back when I did a lot of stock, it was there were more agencies. It was pretty much all rights managed. Some of it still is. I don't turn down a good stock sale when one comes along. I'm pretty much down to just one agency that's that's really kind of a boutique specialty agency. And, you know, keep in mind here, <laughs> if you ask two photographers, you get three opinions. <laughs> yep. Stock it may work great for some people and not for others. I, I think if you're not already with an established agency, it's kind of tough because it's hard to get into the big agencies like Corbis and Getty, which... They own a lot of everything out there, and everything sort of got consolidated years ago. There still are boutique agencies out there. I have a friend that's hugely successful with a, a hunting and fishing stock agency, and he's got the best hunting and fishing stuff in the world, and he, you know, he beats out Getty and Corbis and all these places that don't have anything nearly as good as him and his cadre of photographers. But that's kind of a specialty thing. So, you know, my opinion is that as a general thing, no stock might not be the, the greatest way to do it. There, there are a lot of micro stock opportunities, but you really have to sell a ton of that stuff. And I think there are really only a handful of people that do really well with micro stock. I, I would say you really have to want to do it and really work hard at it because stock, again, it's, it's like a whole other business. A lot of these things we talk about in photography, they're just almost separate businesses unto themselves. You know, just pursuing fine art versus commercial, it's a very different game. Certainly workshops, uh, that's, that's a whole different game unto itself. And, and I think stock is another one of those. So in, in my case, no, I don't do a lot with stock. I find other avenues to be a better place to put my time and efforts. Uh, that's not to say that someone else might not want to try it. You mentioned the workshops in there, and uh, let's talk a little bit about those. What types of photographer are your workshops aimed at? And what does the structure of a successful workshop look like from an organizational standpoint? You know, a successful workshop, in my opinion, is about fun, engagement, creating a synergy, and putting together something that's so rewarding for your clients that they want to do more. So I think the organizational part is sort of born out of those goals, and those are my goals when I teach a workshop. It has to be about fun and pushing the creative limits of people and having them walk away feeling a great reward. So to achieve that, I limit it to very small groups, and typically I would say maybe 8 to 12 participants. As far as the type of photographer, it kind of depends on the workshop, but I, I cover all levels. I've got a digital photo basics 
workshop I do. And then I would say the broadest range of my overseas workshop because I'm working with a small number of photo participants. So on my, on my overseas workshops, uh, we've designed them from the ground up to cater to both photographers and non-photographers. That might sound a little counterintuitive, but if you think about, you know, I put myself in the shoes of my customer. When you think about somebody spending a lot of money to do an overseas workshop, they've got the airfare and they've got the cost of the workshop and all those things. Often they want a friend or a spouse to come along with them. And we've designed ours to cater to them too. So if I'm doing something photo specific, say a critique and review session with the photo participants, um, Michelle or Brad or my wife, uh, who are, these are people that assist me on my workshops, are out with the non-photo people doing different things. Because what I found in my research many years ago, and, and actually just keeping track of it over the years, is there are tons and tons of great places to go with workshops, and few, very few, if any, have anything for the non-photo participants, the travel companions to do. So I'm just mentioning this because that allows me a smaller number of photo participants, plus I always have at least one extra assistant slash instructor with me to keep the ratio nice and low. And that way people are a lot happier. I can cover a much broader range. I, I had a workshop in Tuscany a couple of years ago where I had everybody from uh, a couple people using point and shoots that were strictly amateurs to a guy who was uh, a Pulitzer Prize photographer. And I can handle that kind of range with, um, with very small numbers. Now my domestic workshops, I would say, I, I certainly get beginners, but I would say on average, they tend to be more, say, an intermediate level and above. And that's just because of the nature of it. And on those, you, you tend to have fewer people wanting to travel as couples or friends or whatever. Um, you tend to have more just the individual photographers that want to do it, you know. And so I think that that small ratio is really important. And then I also uh, do workshops with Arizona Highways. And that allows me to do more workshops, which is nice because I love teaching. And they basically do all the coordination. And that takes a huge burden off me or my assistant or whoever's helping me with it and, and just allows me more time to do things. So with those non-participants, now we know where the ice cream bill comes from. <laughs> yes. So one last question. If you could time travel back to when you first started out, what business advice would you offer to your younger self? I would say, Joel, go into medicine or law. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, you know, I think I would, I would tell myself not to be afraid of anything. Because what I've found over the years is when you're uncomfortable and maybe a little scared, you're doing your best work. And this applies not only to the photography and the photographs and the images and stories you're creating, but, but also from a business standpoint. If you're not willing to take a risk and fall on your face and get up and, and try it again, it's harder to establish yourself and, and get very far in what you're doing. The other thing I, I've actually told other people starting out, and I, and I may have told myself too, and it kind of depends what kind of photography you're going into, but you might want to try a part of it that we're, we're speaking maybe for people in the United States now, but to go to a large city, a market where there are all kinds of resources like, say, New York or San Francisco. And, and there are just vast resources there. Yes, it's more competitive, but there are also a lot more people you can work with and mentor with and that sort of thing. So th those are probably a couple of the things I would have told myself if I had this magic time machine. Fantastic. Well, Joel, thank you so much. Uh, this has been wonderful. I really, really enjoyed talking with you and you've got my, uh, my feet itching. <laughs> I want to pack my bags and get on a plane and go traveling around and go capture some, some cool stuff. And one of the things that I think about actually is that I live in Memphis, Tennessee, you know, Elvis land, although I, don't, I do not do Elvis impressions. Oh, darn, I was going to ask you to do one. <laughs> I tried it once and uh, it didn't, did not work out. But, you know, we, we often neglect a lot of the stuff that's on our doorstep. I think, you know, don't kind of neglect your, your hometown for some interesting f photographs too, you know, especially to kind of get yourself started and get into the, the mode, if you like, of being a travel photographer. Go out and see it from a traveler's perspective. Yeah, thanks for saying that. That's an excellent point. You, you have to remember that wherever you are is desirable and exotic for someone else to travel to. And it, and it is great to look at it from that standpoint. There's, it kind of reminds me of a little assignment I sometimes give people, particularly in the beginning workshops, where I, 
I call it the 1010. They have to they have to shoot within a 10 foot radius of where they are, and that means they have to shoot something in that 10 foot circle, and they have to do 10 different photos, and try to make them all good. So, talking about close to home, it's an excellent point, and and really, I'm glad you brought that up. You really do need to think about. You can find photos anywhere, so so try to take uh, Nigel's advice and give yourself that mindset. Thank you so much. This has been really wonderful. Great advice in here from Joel about travel photography, and I think it's going to take several listens to this to really get them all down. But on behalf of everybody listening, Joel, I would like to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and expertise and I wish you all the very best with your upcoming trips and uh, fun adventures in different parts of the world. Well, it's my pleasure, Nigel, and, and thank you so much for having me on your, uh, on your show here. I really enjoyed it.